So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Peers of Partners Expanding the Lots and Provisions Across Scotland. So my name is Kerry Ann Cahoon and I'm a Training and Development Officer for Peer and the Supply and I work for the Scottish Drugs Forum. So today we're going to be speaking about the importance of Peer and the Supply within communities and prison settings. Um, so now I'm going to ask my colleague Wes Steele to come on and we're going to be doing a 10 minute presentation on the why and how of peer supply. That's brilliant, Carrie Ann. Thank you very much. Yes, so my name is Wesley Steele. I'm a, also a training and development officer supporting peer and oxygen supply across Scotland. So just before I talk a bit about the actual the why of peer and oxygen supply, I want to just tell people what naloxone is, just for anybody that's attending the webinar today that might not already know. So naloxone is a safe medication which we can all learn to use and carry with us. It can reverse the effects of an overdose, restoring a person's breathing until help arrives, potentially saving that person's life. There is no reason not to carry and use naloxone when someone is unresponsive and may be experiencing an overdose. So why do we need more naloxone within our communities? Sadly, drug deaths in Scotland continue to rise year on year and are currently at the highest level they have ever been. Scotland has the worst rate in Europe and things appear to only be getting worse. Last year alone, we lost 1,339 people to a drug-related death. This figure is far too high and can we, we can all play a part in reducing it. As a part of the government's response in 2020, the First Minister announced a £250 million funding package for, for use over the next five years, calling it part of a national mission to end what is currently a national disgrace. And I can honestly say that I've never agree, agreed more strongly with a politician than with that statement. So of those people who unfortunately died, 89% of them, or 1,192, all had opiates or opioids implicated directly in their death. And that's what this graph here represents. Had naloxone been available and in the hands of the right people, in the right place and at the right time, this figure would have been much, much lower. That is 1,192 people who needn't have died. And everyone is someone, someone. A husband, a wife, a mum, a dad, a son, daughter, brother, neighbour or friend. And each one has left behind a grieving family. So why a peer supply model? What is so good about a peer supply? Peers have immediate credibility and reach into the most at-risk populations. The populations which are not known to services and therefore are not being offered any support or harm reduction, including naloxone. People talk quite often about credibility and what that actually means. It's very difficult for me to sit here on a webinar and try and convey the importance of a peer's credibility within their own community and, and offering people this life-saving intervention might be much widely, more widely accepted by people the person at risk deems to be credible. What we may deem credible as professionals does not always transfer into kind of real life scenarios. And that for me is where peers can really come into their own. Peers have a unique and current insight into ever-changing drug trends. The availability and effectiveness of service provision or the lack thereof and they can identify areas and groups in most need. Peers get information in real time. They do not need to wait for stats or reports to know what is happening within their very own community. Peers are amongst the most highly motivated people that I've ever had the pri privilege of working alongside and they clearly have the most to lose when the lockdown provision is lacking. It is them burying their loved ones, their friends, their partners, their neighbours. It's not us. So peers are arguably much more accessible and approachable for people who use drugs because they do not fear reprisals or services being withdrawn when they're approaching peers. And I've seen real life first hand examples of this. I've seen professionals trying to approach people to offer them harm reduction advice and or naloxone training and supply. And it's not been taken. It's not been taken up by them, especially in some kind of supported accommodation settings or prescribing services where people who are using drugs 
correctly or incorrectly, are fearing re repercussions from them disclosing they might be using or from even taking a kit. People think there's sometimes going to be a backlash. They don't, they don't perceive that backlash when it's a peer supply model. They don't fear the, the judgment and they don't fear any services being withdrawn. Peers are often accepted and trusted in, in ways that conventional professionals never ever will be. This can be due to people who use drugs feeling judged and stigmatized by not only services, but wider society. Peers are able to inform and improve service provision quickly in response to challenges such as what we've seen in COVID and services being closed and also changing drug markets. And we can learn from them, but only if we're willing to listen and to implement the suggestions that they make. So when sometimes I am asked, why have peers involved? Peers often work in ways that other people can't. So surely a better question to be asking services is why not? And I sincerely hope that we will see peer naloxone supply expanded and embedded right across Scotland nationally, because we are in the grips of an epidemic and it is a crisis. And I think this is one of the ways that we can help reduce these shocking figures of the drug related deaths. And that is it. I'm going to hand it back over to Kerry Ann now, please. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Liz. So, first of all, the aim of the project. So, the project was funded for two years by the Drug Death Task Force Innovation Fund with the hope of the outcomes to be establishing embedded support and high quality peer supply of naloxone as a core service across Scotland and to ensure those involved in peer supply have an active voice in delivery of naloxone and other harm reduction interventions, including the sharing of promotion of good practice. So how do we know the peer supply works? So if we look at our predecessors back in 2017, there was a project in Glasgow that was implemented um, and over 1,000 naloxone kits were provided by peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, if you can see the picture on the screen, all of these peers, 75% of the peers um, that were involved in this project um, have now secured full-time employment um, in healthcare and social services. Um, also, the ADPs funded a lead uh, naloxone coordinator from Glasgow, um, who was also involved in a peer group with the Simon community. Um, so the answer to the question, how do we know it works, is this is the evidence, do you know it's worked since 2017, it still continues to work um, within Glasgow, um, that they've continued this project. So how peers are recruited? So peers with lived and lived living experience of alcohol and substance use. The Scottish Drugs Forum approached the ADP's areas to help identify the best partners to deliver the peer supply and they look at what areas have gaps delivering peer supply. And um, we'll be seeing peers as partners, so peers will be our colleagues. Um, and we'll be learning from other areas of established peer supply um, within their area. So I know for myself, I started the SDF eight weeks ago, um, and Wes has been working for a few months, so he's already established um, projects in the areas of BND and the borders. So I'm able to learn from Wes. Um, so since I've started, it's the, the projects that the areas that I'm covering is Fife, the Highlands, and Four Valley, and it's happened quite quickly because I'm able to learn from Wes. Um, so it's taking off quite quickly, which is which is good. So how will peers be supported? So the coordinator from each area um, will be supporting peers with training and induction and four weekly supervision. Um, myself and Mays will also be available to support if needed with the induction of the peers or any further training. And even if you just need like someone to talk to, um, or as I said, you know, further training, we're able to signpost them to that. Um, peers will receive phones and equipment um, when they're recruited. Um, they'll also be given emails um, and shown how to access their email. Um, during COVID, we're very limited to doing face-to-face, -face, so a lot of our work is done online through Teams and stuff. So the peers will be shown how to access that. Um, the peers will be paid as a session worker for up to four hours per project, and there'll be an alternative incentive uh, when required for the prisons. Um, and paid work has never been done before um, for peers um, that deliver peer-to-peer. Um, no, so within the prison services, um, what's going to happen is the peers that are already got a job within the prison, they will be getting bonuses. So there will be you get extra um, you get extra money within the prison if you're a past man. So they'll be getting 
once a recruiting and stuff, we'll be getting that. So we'll be getting it coming within the prison as well, which again is is amazing. Um, and training support from the Scottish Trust Forum. So we'll be delivering myself and Rose will be delivering training for trainers once the players are all recruited and through the PVG process. Um, we'll also be delivering reflection sessions as well and one-to-ones. If peers are struggling at all, you know, we're delivering um, the one-to-one, which I'm sure there won't be. Um, myself and ways will just be you know, at the end of the phone to offer them that support. We'll be having to, uh, weekly team meetings with the peers and project seeing groups um, monthly, every four weeks we're all involved. And um, we'll also be having a national and also network every 12 weeks. And we had the first one a few weeks ago and it went really, really well. And it was really good to hear from different areas, which I'm sure you'll hear from today, because a lot of the areas are here today to do the presentations. So how peers will inform the project? So we'll be gathering real life case studies, good and bad experience to help shape practice. So. Um, Claire Marie from the prison service, she's going to be doing her presentation today and speaking about a, a case study. So that's the kind of information we're going to be gathering. Um, as I said before, the peers are treated as partners, you know, they'll be our colleagues and they'll not be seen as, as, as volunteers, they'll be seen as part of our team um, and have responsibilities which will benefit them. Um, you know, they're able to, to work um, alongside them to support them in that role. And we'll learn from other areas that have established peer support. And they'll have involvement in local local ADP meetings. I see peers as the experts, you know, they're the ones with the lived experience, which I feel is the most beneficial and valuable thing, thing to that organ thing to that organization. And it will be evaluated over year one with peers participating in interviews. So thank you so much. That's myself and Wes's presentation. Um, so next, we are going to hear from Danny Kelly um, from Hillcrest Futures DB. Um, thanks very much, Danny, for presenting. I know that um, we can't see you, but your presentation is going to be on the screen. So it's from Danny, Eddie, Amir, and Justina. Uh, Teresa. 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 Sorry, Danny. No, that's okay. Hi, folks. So yeah, my name is uh, Danny Kelly. I'm the manager for the harm reduction service, and I manage that across Tayside. Um, I just wanted to start by giving a little bit of background briefly around obviously the the year or almost two years that we've all kind of faced in terms of uh, COVID-19 and how that's impacted on services and especially around the uh, IEP delivery. The numbers that we have there around the 991 unique individuals, I would probably say that's almost halved within the last year and I think that's reflective of the, the national picture of people uh, accessing equipment. Um, that being said, we had to look at more proactive ways to ensure that people at risk, people being isolated, people who are more vulnerable, were being able to access IEP, uh, BBV, naloxone, and ensure that people were being seen and still had access to services. So that led on to the, the out, uh, assertive outreach approach in March when, when COVID hit. And that kind of gives a little bit of backing of then how, where, and when the the peers were able to be uh, supporting some of the work that we've done kind of during lockdown and as we've emerged from lockdown. I just kind of wanted to kind of put that in, in this part. As a, um, sorry, I should have said, sorry, as a, a IEP site, we're a, an enhanced site delivering needle exchange across Tayside and um, we work in partnership with uh, local, um, local police to provide partnership events and whatnot. So it's been great to have their involvement through this and that came as well along with when we've been doing the nasal naloxone um, rollout within Dundee. So on in April 28th we launched the peer, we had the peer naloxone event. So we had six peers initially sign up to the the, the peer naloxone delivery as a part of Hillcrest Futures, our, our pilot. And so it was great to have the peers involved. Some of the guys were already doing stuff with us and some of them were new to the project and each of them brought their own experience and their own kind of personal uh, lived experience to that which has um, en massively enhanced the work that we've been doing. So on the event in the 28th as you see it, we delivered 40 kits to a variety of uh, public members raising awareness and breaking down stigma that um, naloxone and overdose has 
um, and we're joined by our uh, colleagues. Uh, Wes came along from SDF and our partners in, in police and Dundee City Council um, to come along and launch the event, which was great in, in terms of getting that public awareness out there as well. So in terms of the role, um, basically, as kind of what's been said previously, we wanted to ensure that the, the peers have had a, a role to engage as far and wide across Dundee and ensure that those people during difficulties in the past year have maybe been a bit isolated, where services haven't been opened, those people have been able to get access to the naloxone and overdose awareness. So that's taken place in a variety of different settings, uh, uh, church-based groups, um, hostels, uh, local hubs, etc. And so from April to June, as you can see, 166 kits have been supplied, with 71 of them being uh, first supplies. So I think, uh, personally, uh, the peers have done a fantastic job in that, that first initial period and in reaching those uh, populations um, and, and driving home the, the message around overdose, uh, overdose awareness. I'd like to now kind of pass on to the peers to let them give you their perspective of, of the role and whatnot. So first, I'm going to pass on to, to Amir. Thanks, Danny. I am Amir. Um, I'm a peer naloxone worker. Um, I got the opportunity to come on board uh, right at the start of the, the campaign. Um, I've got lived experience uh, in this field. And the, the, the benefit of being paid um, as opposed to my volunteering, there's a few things. Uh, what it was is it, it made me feel uh, more equal to paid members of staff. It made me feel more part of a team, uh, that, that kind of unit. Um, Although there wasn't much difference, I mean, the, the team that we're involved with always made you feel welcome anyway. But just for my own, um, for my own self, that, that that was the the benefit there. It gave me a new purpose, hope, uh, and confidence, especially at the start, because um, I'd not long came out of um, well, sorry, I'd been in a rehabilitation unit, a residential one, previously, and so this was my first time actually trying to get into paid work and. Um, yeah, like I say, it gave us that hope and confidence that I, I could get back into this, you know, get back into the workplace because I'd worked all my days. Um, it also allowed me, I've got two young kids, so it gave me a little bit more money in my pocket that I could uh, give to pay, pay for their school clothes, pay for summer holidays and that sort of thing. That, that's just a, a feel-good factor for myself as well. And it also helped with my relationship with my ex-wife, you know, it made it slightly easier, the fact that I'm paying that little bit more. Um, also, the job satisfaction for me is, is a massive thing, knowing that I'm saving lives. Um, and where I'd go is I usually, I'm in the Salvation Army, um, the Steeple Church and Jericho House, which is a rehabilit residential rehabilitation unit. And what it's done is it's given me an insight into what's going on day to day, minute by minute, you know, you start to build up the trust um, with the service users um, and the amount of times I've heard that they've actually used an Oloxone kit and it's, it's brought someone around and it has saved lives. Uh, you, for me, you can't put uh, money on that, you know, the money can't buy that. It's just a fantastic thing and knowing that you've given them that training and that opportunity. Uh, and that leads me to, to my last uh, thing that it's actually given me. It's given me new opportunities um, built with that confidence. I'm actually um, I've been offered a full-time employment uh, to coincide with, with this job as well. And at the start of April, uh, there was nothing like that on the, on the cards. But as I say, because I've, been, uh, because I've done this for a number of months and built up that confidence, uh, I'm really blessed to say that I've, I've got a full-time job as well. So that's me. What I'll do is I will pass you on to Eddie. Thanks, Amir. Yeah. Hi, I'm Eddie. I'm also a peer worker uh, with Hillcrest and the SDF. Um, I've actually volunteered for a wee while now, um, doing outreach and stuff like that about the streets and in the hostels. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I just came out of the rehab as well a couple of years ago, uh, same one as Amir was in, in fact. Uh, and I, I, volunteer, uh, I started volunteering doing the harm reduction and getting out all the streets and stuff like that. But uh, getting paid for the, starting to get paid for in the walk zone, and that's it's given me extra confidence. It's making me feel as if I'm, I'm actually part of a team now. Uh, 
got a wee bit more respect in that. Um, it saves me for trying to feel as if I can deal with people's uh, queries and problems when they come to me instead of just like signposting and stuff like that. Um, um, and what else? Uh, it's allowed me to have money for the first time in a long time. In fact, the first time ever, all my money went on other stuff before. Uh, so it's good to have a thought to uh, get paid. Um, it's also given me the confidence to go forward. My, my, my main goal is to go for full time employment, but whenever having that before, I'm kind of trying to ease myself into it. So this has been a good way of doing it. Um, getting into the hostels and then in the walk zone and stuff like that has been going really well and it's been getting uh, people people are coming in and really opening up to us uh, because obviously with the lived experience they feel as if they can open up a bit more. Uh, so I feel as if I bring that to the table. Um, as I may have said there as well, we're doing really well with it. Um, it's, we've, we've got rid of a real lot in the hostels and stuff. Things are really going really good in there. Um, and as I say, just getting just getting into getting paid, feeling a wee bit more more of the team, uh, it's given me the confidence to go on and get and go for my goal of getting employment. So that's me. So thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you. I'll hand you out to Teaser. <coughs> thanks, Eddie. Um, so hi, I'm Teresa. Um I am um a peer also with the SEF and I work for Hillcrest Futures. Um, I have been doing this in Hillcrest Futures for a lot of while, for a couple of years, um, in the harm reduction. Um, what this has given for me is an opportunity to share my own lived experience. Um, most or a large percentage of the people who we see in harm reduction, um, I know personally, um, and they know or knew me when I was using. Um, so they know that I have been there and done it, and so that they're able to open up a lot more um, than the will to, as we said, like to to like a manager or to somebody who hasn't got lived experience um, and I could use those skills to help them. Um, I also um, started working with the University of Dundee as a peer research assistant um, at, at the start of the year in January um, for a year post, something that I could never have ever seen happening. Um, I never thought I would get any kind of employment, let alone a full-time employment with the university, um, as well as working here. Um, I also definitely can help the people in my own community um, because there is quite a large population of using addicts. Um, in my own community and being able to just go out um, and speak to them on a day-to-day -day basis. And this has all been helped by getting the training that I get at work. It has absolutely supported me for all these further opportunities for me to learn and to gain employment. Um, it's also Excellent that I get to have some money in the bank today, something that I never ever had, because um, all my money would go on drugs, um, basically, at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, that's good for my family as well. So, that's me. Thanks very much. Perfect. And then the last slide there was just to summarise the our campaign that we um, have been delivering around the ODN at me around trying to reduce the stigma associated to overdose and raising awareness of naloxone, which we continue to do across Tayside and as far and as wide as we can. And so to have the peers delivering that message as well has been, has been a great additional tool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and it was very powerful hearing your experiences. 
and knowing that how much this project um, is really helping you. So thank you for that. So now we'll move on to hear a presentation from Lindsay Laird and Piers from We Are With You, the Borders, talking about overcoming the challenges of employing peers. No, that's fine. Okay, so um, I'm Lindsay. I'm the PA and Locksland Coordinator for the Scottish Border Service with We Are With You, and this is Mark, one of our peers. Hi. Um, so our presentation is mainly just a bit of an overview, um, but also we wanted to talk about some of the challenges that we've been overcoming. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so as we all know, the drug related deaths are a national emergency, and thanks to this funding we've been able, and support from SDF, we're now in a position to make a real impact in this area. Okay, so to start with, we were trying to think a little bit outside the box because of the stigma that we're aware of um, around the subject area. So one of the things we tried on one of our Facebook posts was that we got a little bandana uh, that says the Loxone Save Lives and put it on a wee puppy post um, went viral which was amazing um, so we were letting everybody in the area and beyond know what we were doing um, and we realised that peers were the best place um, to target people who might witness um, an overdose. Okay I'll pass it over to Mark who's going to talk to you a bit about why he wanted to be involved in the project. This, this is our um, flyer that we originally made and we posted it out to all of the pharmacies in the borders because it's a very rural area uh, so we wanted to make sure that we got the message out to the whole of the borders uh, when we were recruiting for, for peers for the project and, and I posted it up in uh, corner shops and supermarkets and bus stations and things as well. So here's Mark. Hi there, I'm Mark. Uh, why I'm so uh, in peers today is, yeah, I want to go in and help people. As, as for my story, when I grew up, I had dyslexia and the age of seven, primary six, I got expelled because he always says I was being naughty and not doing my work, but I was thought I was I was doing it. And it wasn't until I was twenty seven in the jail and at an English class that the teacher asked me to stay back and told me that I was actually dyslexic and it filled in a lot of the gaps and I thought, Oh, so I'm no stupid as I've been told all my life. And but because you're getting put into the homes and that, it led me down a rabbit hole into the drug scene and all that sort of life. And it wasn't me, but I couldn't change because the drugs had a hold of me by then. And I just want to get out and help people. I've been in and out of the jail all my life. Lost kids through it. I've got two beautiful girls now in that because of it. But yeah, I've lost my family. I've just, yeah, I do really want to get out there and sort of help people. And we've had a lot of problems with the, getting the set up and mm -hmm. With the, what they call them, the checks and PBG yeah. checks and that, because there was a lot of people that didn't have birth certificates, i.e. me and that, and it was a lot of paper mm -hmm. just trying to get the right paperwork to get that bit of paperwork to get that away and that, but we have overcome it now and so hopefully that helps others in the future. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Good, thank you. And um, next slide please. Okay, so our first challenge was about benefits. So when the peers first came on board, the first thing that they were concerned about was um, the benefits and how it was going to impact on those. So with the help of WES from SDF, we, we overcame that challenge and found out um, what, what the individual benefits the peers were all on and how this work would impact those. Um, um it's also impacted their mental health because it was there was a lot of, of delay in the project getting started but we're now we've now come through that um so through um one-on-one -on -one support and um team meetings every week we've been able to kind of help the peers um get through all the challenges so hopefully we're we're coming at the other end now and uh, the pbgs were another challenge um for us because um most of the peers um didn't have the ID that they needed in order to get a PVG. So we've come, we've come through that now. So that would be a, something that I would suggest to anybody who is thinking about setting up a peer supply project themselves would be to make sure that the, the peers have ID um, initially so that we can that you can send away for their PVG disclosure forms ASAP really, because they take a while to come back. Um, IT, so as Mark was saying, he is dys dyslexic, so um, it's about trying to make sure that the information that we're sharing with the peers is in a format that they understand. 
Um, I secured laptops and phones for them. Um, and we had sessions on how to get onto Teams and that kind of thing. Um, stigma was the other one um, that, that's going to be an ongoing issue, really. Um, so what we've been doing there is that we have been sharing posts on Facebook about what we've been what we're doing, and we have a weekly pop up in the office, and we are doing a, a event next week for Overdose Awareness Day, um, where we're going to try and get people to come along for a peer pop up stall. Uh, so we have um, free ice cream and purple cupcakes, and we have a um, remembrance tree that people can put um, names of people that they've lost to overdose on the tree um, or a little purple ribbon. So that's the kind of things that we've been working on through those. All right, so um, this was our first pop-up stall in Kelso that Wes came down for. It was a really nice day. Um, so Wes had brought down little goodie bags with naloxone kits um, and face masks and stickers and whatever else was in the packs. It was really good. Um, to try and encourage people to come along to the stall to ask what we were doing. Um, so that was a really good day and it was a really good learning experience as well. Um, and this is what I'm taking from this project as a whole really is that I'm learning every day from the peers. I learn something new um, and I'm really open to learning from them and them from me hopefully as well. So it's uh, we're, we're learning from each other. So that's really good. All right. So like I said, we have a drop in at our office every week. Um, and I I encourage people to come along to that um, with a sandwich board we have up in the office all week for people who come into our drop-in. And also um, I put it up on the Facebook page so that people know um, that, that, that it's on today kind of thing. And I have different things in the stall, different information about things that they might be that they might be interested, for example, that they can apply for a Nixoid kit through um, SVAD if they would rather have that rather than the Loxone kit. There's different little leaflets, like for example, we work together with Crew in Edinburgh to put together a, a leaflet on um, how to respond to a drugs overdose and I have little um, fidget toys and things that kind of help people to kind of um, break down barriers and things so like touchable bubbles and little stretchy men and Play-Doh and that kind of thing. All right, so um, we had six people who applied and we've got three peers who are now um, through the recruitment process. Um, like I said, we have Overdose Awareness Day, which is next week. We've got a really good um, event planned for that. Um, we have weekly team meetings. We have the weekly pop-up stall. We're shortly going to be doing the, mm -hmm. the two-day training with WES at STF to get the, the peers trained up and how to teach people how to use an naloxone and when to use it. Um, and we're really looking forward to um, connecting with the other peers nationally to see what we can learn from each other for a bit of peer support as well, um, so that the guys know that they're they're part of something um, bigger than just our project. Um, and we've been working on um, how to target people in a rural area, so thinking about when we do get started, where we're going to target and how we're going to do that, what's that, what's that going to look like. So um, that's it for us. Thank you very much for listening to us and just want to say thank you very much to Wes SDF um, for all the support. Um, it's been very much appreciated. So now the Glasgow Prison Project with NHS GGC Health Improvement Team to join us to talk about the initial, initializing a peer supply within prisons. Hi everyone, um, to begin, to begin with, Doris is going to start off her presentation and then I'll continue from there. Thank you. Lovely, lovely to have the opportunity to present today. I just wanted to um, introduce the, the very fact that we are offering a peer naloxone champion programme within the three prisons in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. I think what is really important is that we have a much wider engagement with people who live in prison. And for me, the acknowledgement for this comes from the fact that people who are in prison, people who live in prison, have a range of skills. Um, but most importantly, they have the opportunity to influence other people who live in prison. Um, my thanks go out to Claire Marie, especially for the fact that in her role as manager and coordinator of the project, She's done a phenomenal job. I'll hand you over to her just now for the presentation. Thanks, Doris. I chose this um, as the first slide for our presentation in recognition um, of our peers who unfortunately can't be with us today. Um, although I wanted to highlight that 
that our journey as well as everyone else's journey who's presented today starts and ends with our mentors. So just a quote from one of our, our mentors as I took the first step to helping others and not just myself. I have been thinking about this for years. So as Doris has mentioned, um, our peer supply model within the prison establishments covers HMP Berlini, HMP Lomos and HMP Greenock. HMP Berlini and HMP Lomos um, are male prisons and HMP Greenock are both male and female within the prison. So in total, we have a coordination of four peer supply programmes across the three establishments. So why a peer supply model within the prison? So Wes had touched on earlier um, that peers themselves have a credibility amongst each other. So that being one of, of the main reasons why we've chosen to have this within the prison establishments. Also acknowledging that one of the most high risk factors um, for overdose is when people are liberated from prison. So our programme itself um, has much support for the mentors so that they can they can offer the same support to others as we know that peer support can often be prepared, preferred from um, professionals from a professional um, support. Peers are easier to access so particularly during um, the COVID restrictions um, certainly within the residential areas of the prisons um, peers have easier access to each other than they do to professionals and other services. The aim of our programme might be, I guess, quite quite different to some of the community programmes um, in that those who are living in prison, their overall aim is to issue and train, sorry, to train and issue Nixoid um, to every single person who's been liberated from prison and share those harm reduction messages um, in a time where someone's at most risk. So in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to talk about our approach. Um, the approach that we took to the recruitment, the delivery, training and accreditations and the support that will be offered. And it's all very specific to um, the, prison, the prison pilot. So on the slide here, you can see our, um, our application, um, the Peer Mentors Wanted application, which went out to, we currently have the programme live in HMP Berlin. This application went out to every single person, so nearly, nearly 1,500 people who reside in Berlin received one of these applications um, and were encouraged to express their interest in the programme. Um, also following an information drop at various areas within the establishment, we had 91 individuals express interest in the programme, which was phenomenal. Following suitability checks um, and people getting liberated, we invited over 40 of those who expressed interest to information sessions to receive more information about the programme. We had created a, a very structured appro approach to the programme and to the recruitment to ensure that we retain the mentor engagement. Um, and this was done through um, a similar process that we would if we were having an employed member of staff. So each participant would have their own handbook that they would go through um, and that they would attend quite a structured um, recruitment process, including an information session, a full day induction, and an overview on the training and qualifications that they would be receiving. We currently have in HMP Berlin 11 peer champions trained um, who are spread across the, the residential areas within the establishment to ensure we get that reach out there um, to all other people who are living in the prison. And we have a number of individuals who um, we will be getting together in the near future to train as well. At, at the side, again, um, I'm really keen that, that our peer mentors are heard in this, so I would like to take part in this training because I found my brother OD and had to give, had to give him the lock zone without training. So this was a quote in one of our information sessions from a participant. And for me, this evidences that the peer mentors, peer champions are the ones who bring skills, experience and knowledge when we provide the platform for them to do so. So for me, this was really powerful. Um, in terms of even without the training, um, peers are very are very credible and have the knowledge that they can pass on to others. So our delivery, um, and I guess starting on a positive with that quote that's on the screen just now, info I have received throughout my training so far has been amazing. And I guess for us, um, 
for, for delivering the programme. That gives, gives that boost to encourage we're going in a positive direction with the programme. Um, as I discussed, the, the initial engagement um, with the programme when we put out the information was fantastic, um, as demonstrated by the, the 91 people who had expressed interest. And I've been very clear from the, the beginning of the programme with all peer champions that this delivery of the programme um, is a two-way learning. I will equally as learn as much from those who participate in the programme as hopefully they will from the training that we provide. The information session that I spoke about on the last slide, um, we ran multiple sessions uh, on multiple dates throughout the establishment uh, to ensure that participants had a, a, an in-depth understanding and overview of the programme. Um, and it was really an opportunity for us as well to gather initial engagement from participants to see where people were at with their motivations and in being involved in the programme. The, the induction sessions, that was um, much more kind of in-depth starting training with the peer mentors. Um, this had an overview of, of what the role was. They would complete their handbook. We would go through the boundaries of the role and also included the starting of their training, where we looked at um, basic communication skills and a more in-depth session around emotional literacy, which included things like self-awareness, self-management, awareness of others and relationship management. Um, and for me, this was really important to ensure that everybody was kind of starting on the same level um, when uptaking the role. In terms of our training, um, so first and foremost, most the, the mentors um, will complete their training for trainers and naloxone training um, provided by the Scottish Drugs Forum um, and other opportunities that we'll provide going forward will be very much led by the learning needs of the participants and the feedback that they give us. Um, this will include things like health behaviour change training, drug awareness sessions, healthy mind sessions which is a mental health resource developed by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Board. Um, and will also provide the opportunity to participate in other health topic trainings where the need arises from the peer mentors. By participating in the training um, and delivering the programme as a whole, the peer champions will have the opportunity to achieve their Community Achievement Award from Glasgow Kelvin College. This is an award at SCQF Level 4 and 5 um, and it automatically guarantees an interview at Glasgow Kelvin College if the participant wishes to do so upon liberation, um, which is something that has went down very, very well um, with quite a lot of the participants so far. The participants um, will also accrue a Volunteer Hours Award to show their commitment to the programme. And in the short time that we have engaged with the, the peer champions already, we're already seeing that enhanced confidence, enhanced self-esteem um, that generating positive self-image um, and an increased level of independence within the peer groups themselves, both through one-to-one -one support and supervision and also in the, the group learning sessions. Um, and I guess that kind of just backs up the quote I gave at the very beginning about the information that they've been given so far. In terms of the, the role and commitment, um, I'm not going to go too much into that because I guess that's very similar for for most peers who are participating in this programme. Um, I guess it was just to highlight for us that there is maybe a spe more specific role within the prison establishment um, and that there might be some different factors that impact the mentors or that may differ from the community. Um, and because of this, we had decided to take the programme forward um, and have a, a kind of self-exclusion model of, of the um, of the peer champion programme and really the way that we put this across to our, our peer champions was to ensure that individuals are supported so if they're at a time where they don't feel that the peer mentor rules for them that we will ensure that they are supported to engage with other services until they're at a point where they can come back around into the role and um, so no one will ever be excluded from the role um, and I guess that kind of covers in terms of our organisational commitment as well. And as I kind of said on the first slide, is that where we can provide the platform for individuals, it will be them taking the programme forward. I um, touched on briefly there that we also, as an organisation, will be providing ongoing regular group learning sessions um, and one-to-one -one support and supervision sessions. 
I'm now going to pass you over to Doris, um, who's going to share the journey of one of our, our peer champions. Um, so Doris, over to you. Thank you very much, Clemmy. Um, unlike the other projects in time for this, today we've been unable to arrange to have a peer mentor with us. So we asked one young man, who I'll call John, to write his experience down. He's entitled it, Naloxone Saves Lives. Hi, I've been asked to write a few lines about my reasons and motivations for wanting to be part of the prison's new Naloxone and Nixoid champions and peer mentors. I wanted to be involved for a few reasons, but I'd, I'd say the first one that comes to mind would be the most important, and it's the one that it saves lives. I've personally been involved in an addict's way of life and been addicted to heroin as well as other opiates, as well as Valium, etc. I understand a lot of the dangers that people in that position face. So many people in my life have died due to overdose situations, and it hurts to realise that they could have so easily have lived had someone been around them with an Aloxone Nixoid kit. I lost a partner in 2013 due to have taken methadone at a party on top of alcohol and still having Valium in her system. I was in prison at the time, but there were others there that thought she was sleeping and described her snoring. If they had known what to look for and either of the naloxone kits had been available, she would maybe just be here today. I've had close friends die of mixing drugs too, and it hurts to think that they could very easily have been saved had they known about the dangers of mixing methadone and street Valium or if a Nixoid kit was available. Not one of them had to die this way. My second reason to be involved in this programme is because it has saved my own life outside twice, and most recently in here in Berlin's Romans Hall. As some people are aware, a newer form of atizolam has been seen in Scottish prisons, and it's, be, it's soaked in paper and sold in that form. No one is aware of how much they are taking. On the 26th of December, Boxing Day, I took atizolam on top of my, naloxone, my methadone prescription. I stupidly thought that I would be fine as being involved in that kind of drugs like that in the past. I knew what to look for and that I was more than capable of being able to handle whatever feeling hit I would get. I was found unconscious at four o'clock later that day, along with my cellmate, and I was given naloxone twice by a prison nurse to bring me round. In fact, to bring me back as I had overdosed. I was extremely lucky as the hall was only 30 minutes away from complete lockup. And if I hadn't been found when I had, then an officer would have unfortunately found me dead of an overdose the next morning. I am, in fact, extremely lucky to be alive today, as it, as it was down to me being given the naloxone when I was. I can only imagine. What if there was no naloxone? The next day, an officer said something to me that gave me a fright. She said, do you realise that if you had died, that every time, every Christmas, your son would have had in the future would have been with, with sadness? Because Christmas would always be a reminder to him and all of my family that I stupidly and selfishly took drugs and died in prison. She also said that someone would, have, someone would have had the horrible job of phoning my mum to tell her that her son died in jail. I should add at this point that given the erratic and stupidly dangerous life I've led in the past, means that at least when I get to jail, then my mum and sister relax and they're relieved because at the very least they know where I am and that I'm safe. These are some of the reasons why I wanted to be involved in the Naloxone Peer Mentor pro Program. My motivation comes from the fact that I want to give something back. I want to help others like me. I want to help others and stop other prisoners' families from going through an overdose situation. And I realise that I'm in a position to do just that. I want to raise awareness of Naloxone and Nixoid because all overdoses can be preventable. And I know firsthand how and why it works and how important it is. The idea that prisoners speaking and teaching other prisoners is so, so good because the fact of the matter is 
that we can connect where others can't. We're in amongst it all. We can get the points across so much easier. It's our peers and family that are overdosing and sadly dying. If we can teach and educate prisoners on the dangers, the myths, the facts, the use of naloxone and nixoid, and get more of these kits out and in places that matter, and into the hands of the kind of people where they will be most effective, then that can only be a win-win for everyone. These newer street drugs like ketazolam and, and fentanyl are so scary. They are here. We need all the help that we can get. Naloxone and nitsoid save lives. Fact, I know. I don't need much more motivation than that. All overdoses are preventable. I think for me, the most poignant thing about that is I was the nurse on duty. It was me that administered the naloxone to that man. And it absolutely lifts my heart to think it made a difference. I'll hand you back to, to Claire Marie. Thanks, Doris. Again, I said, I said this programme begins and ends with our peer mentors. So here's a quote just to finish up. I felt for the first time since being in prison, I can make an actual impact to someone's life and future. Um, and for me, um, this was really powerful. And I think just briefly to, to put in here that going forward um, for this programme, not only are we keen to provide this opportunity, but provide other opportunities for those who live in prison, to provide education and training to others who live in prison. Um, and one example of that, um, and I know others have touched on it, is for Overdose Awareness Day next week, which will be running across the three establishments. Um, and not only the impact that that has for those who live in prison, but also for the staff um, who, who work in prison, um, and the, the kind of knock-on effect that this programme has had, that now all health improvement staff um, who work within the prisons are now registered with SFAD and carry naloxone. Um, and that will be putting it in the next staff newsletter for all prison healthcare staff to encourage all staff to uptake this opportunity. Thank you very much to everyone for listening um, and our contact details are there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire Marie and Doris. Thanks a lot as well for coming and sharing the great work that's been going on there. And the case study was kind of choked me up a bit, so thanks for that. So moving on, we'll now hear from Leanne Kerr, Jennifer Lang, Scott McCready and Stuart Jackson from Turning Point Scotland, North Ayrshire, who will be talking about forming an alliance with local partners. Thanks, Kerry Ann. Hey, I'm Jennifer Lang and we're delighted to be here today. With me is my colleagues, Leanne Kerr, Scott McCready and Stuart Jackson. We are from Turning Point Scotland's North Ayrshire Prevention, Early Intervention and Recovery Service. And that's our motto there throughout this whole programme, regardless of what part of the service we deliver, it's just to keep it simple. So the di distribution of naloxone, naloxone has been a priority of our local drug death prevention group in North Ayrshire since before our service was even commissioned. And using budget from this subgroup, we were initially given funds to purchase kits to allow our team to distribute them. Following additional funding from the ABP that came from the Drug Death Task Force, we were given the funds to develop a programme for volunteers who had experience of using substances to distribute naloxone in the local community. It had been recognised that low in North Ayrshire we were good at raising awareness of naloxone and training service workers, as well as distributing people in services who were at risk of an overdose. There was something missing, particularly with the distribution to family and friends of people at risk of overdose or to those not engaging in statutory services. With the recent introduction of Nixoid, the nasal spray, it was felt that this would be more convenient for family members to hold. We quickly put a course together for our volunteers. Um, I'd like to thank Cara Dunney from the Prevention Service Support Team, the whole team at SDF, um, Alex Adams, who's our lead pharmacist for Ayrshire and Aaron, as well as Tracy Kluska for all the resources, the advice, the support and the guidance to develop the programme and the continued support since. Um, I certainly would have been lost as to where to even start without them. Um, so Cara had developed a whole new training programme for our naloxone volunteers and has since come back three more times to deliver the same programme. Our full-time peer support practitioners delivered the rest of the training programme to support the development and the understanding of the new volunteers. The training has continually developed since the first course with the support of the volunteers and their feedback. 
and we're volunteering have since been working alongside our peer support practitioners to actually facilitate the course and train the new volunteers coming through. We recently ran our fourth course and have trained 14 individuals so far. Hi, I'm Leanne. Um, since we actually started the programme, we've distributed 101 kits. Um, really put that as obviously being 101 potential lives saved that may have been missed. We're already aware of at least two situations when someone used the kits after receiving it to bring someone round from an overdose. 93 of these kits have been first supplies and 8 have been repeat supplies, which has been either due to initial kits being expired or having to use them in someone. The introduction of the nasal sprays in Ayrshire and Aaron have certainly been a positive one. We offer the choice to the individuals we meet for their preferred kit and the nasal spray is shown as effectiveness. We are the second biggest distributor of kits across Ayrshire and Aaron Health Board with only NHS addictions team in front. Um, one of the main areas we were keen to target when we started the programme was to target families and friends of individuals who were at risk of overdose. This was a key area for us. Due to the number of drug-related deaths that happen at home alone, it is important to ensure that close contacts of individuals at risk were also equipped with a kit. We are certainly on track for that aim and have supported the increase of kits distributed to family and friends across the health board. Although we try and avoid distributing our kits to service workers, due to them being able to retrieve this through the PSS team, there are situations where we deem it appropriate to train and equip them. So what's gone well for us is, being such a small area with horrendous statistics and drug-related deaths, most of our volunteers have not went unharmed by a drug-related death, but it was a direct family member or a loved one, or someone within the local community. Not many of us in North Ayrshire haven't suffered. This is very clear in the passion that drives our volunteers. No one wants to see another person die of a preventable death, so they push themselves well out of their comfort zones to raise as much awareness in every community across North Ayrshire. Two of our local community centres approached our volunteers to come in and train their volunteers. A member of the security staff in a local shopping mall approached our volunteers and asked if they could train and equip the other security staff with an So We do patrols with our colleagues in Police Scotland to ensure that people they come into contact with are also aware of the work zone. None of this would be possible with, without the support of the services across our local authority. We have had national recognition of our project with our volunteers writing a blog for the Drug Death Task Force website and being involved in discussions about how this could be rolled out nationally, as well as developing resources for our local authorities who are just starting out their own projects. The support across the country and locally has been overwhelming. Our volunteers have grown in confidence since they started the programme. Some even trained the next cohort of volunteers too. Although our volunteers are not paid, using the budget allocated to give them something back, um, obviously for the volunteers that donating their time, we managed to fit fund bus passes to give them the chance to travel in the area every day and not just on volunteering days. We were fortunate that the ADP also awarded us funding to offer some part-time posts to people progressing on from volunteering and we have now offered three posts for individuals who volunteered with us. Not only did this show that there are opportunities, but it also shows that we have values and skills and knowledge that they can bring to the service in the wider community. The success of these projects are not a secret. It's fairly obvious that the work that the individuals with previous and current experience in using substances can save lives just as much as traditional methods of service delivery. We need to be willing to take risks and try new and innovative approaches to get wider distribution nationally, although this is getting better. Investment in sustainable funding for these projects is pivotal to its success. We made the decision not to immediately put our volunteers through a PDG. This was highlighted when we moved forward with employment opportunities. The chance of our volunteers being considered for listing through the Disclosure Scotland process was a worry due to their history. Although we appreciate the process and understand why it's there, it makes things very difficult for our volunteers to possess the employment. We've written countless supporting statements to Disclosure Scotland, as well as our volunteers gathering numerous other statements. However, the process is still very lengthy and can hinder opportunities. We've applied for PVGs in April and some, some of these have still not been returned. Although unlike other projects speaking here today, we've been awarded funding for this. It's only two year funding, but I'm confident it won't be the end after two years. However, it's always there at the back of the mind that this could potentially end, and what then? 
we need to encourage allocation of funds to try anything of approaches to push the boundaries of what we have always done and see what else we could do. I'm going to hand over to Scott now to give a little bit of his experience. Hi, uh, I'm Scott. Uh, I was first involved in uh, the very first group of volunteers for a now successful Naloxone program uh, that we've got down here. Um, when I started this, I was already in a good place with my own recovery. Uh, I was also at college. Uh, so for me straight away, this uh, no longer gave me a purpose, but also the chance to gain experiences up to this point. Everything that I've done was all was with my addiction uh, support training in college. That was on theory. So starting this in a lock zone program, that was the first chance for me to actually get out into the community where I've been busy working in the future. So being in this first group, we get given uh, training. And looking back now, I can see my own growth because again, everything was in theory. So actually going out into the streets, especially when this was all new down here, and not only was it just new, everything was also different due to COVID. So straight away, straight away we were faced with difficulties and quickly had to adapt. And for me personally, that allowed me to think on my feet and explore other avenues. As I say, for instance, we identify them as a hotspots and stuff like that, where, and this is coming from people with a lived experience like myself, who wasn't really too far away from the streets at this point. So I identify all the areas where people were, uh, just just all the things that some people maybe don't know. So 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 from there, uh, that had to change because obviously the chemists were shot. Uh, uh, there was like different pickup times, people were me out in the streets and stuff like that. So for, for instance, I identified with 40, 50 people in the space of two hours in one certain area. Now this for that would be maybe like two. So then it was how, as I say, thinking outside the box and it's you know what I mean the stuff was there, so it was up to us to actually go in there. So that was the kind of that was the kind of things that we did. And as I say, sometimes that would be quite frustrating. Uh, some cold, bleak morning when we couldn't even see anyone uh, to actually distribute the locks on. So no disregards that as well. Uh, it's mostly just all about distributing the locks on. For us, it was actually just keeping it there, being in the community, uh, com communicating with folk, telling them what was available, not just through the locks on, but also uh, what other recovery things and programs and all that that were put on as well. Do you know what I mean? So, and also, I was bumping into people who I knew their children and they knew me uh, through being in my community. And this was for the parents who were then saying, well, can we get these kids? Do you know what I mean? So, it was opening all these different avenues. Uh, and then, as I say, when I was talking about uh, the Bleak Morrans and all that, me personally, this whole time doing an Aloxone volunteer program, I began to find things about myself. Do you know what I mean? For instance, at one point, I was the only person left doing it uh, out the first group, but I pushed through all the uncertainties because I believed in it and I knew it was something that was saving lives. So, as I say, I started to find things out about myself. Do you know what I mean? Uh, realised that I had a lot of resilience. I didn't believe much in myself at one point. So at the times when when you weren't like, as I say, you could buy into and say, oh, I'm not being the locks on kit so I need to about and all that. Do you know what I mean? So it's believing in that and then how can you believe in that when you at one point you didn't even believe in yourself. Do you know what I mean? So it's putting you two together and as I say, uh, becoming determined and for me, determination and me increased the more confident I became, which happened through communication with others, which was important. The low point for me was the very first person I ever gave a kit to. The first day I did it, died, found dead the next day eh, with a kit next to him. And that was somebody that I actually grew up with eh, and had seen all, all the things. So that is a, that's a low point for me. And a couple of high points for me that he did it was. Now, as, it's all right getting on a training in theory, but then being out in the streets, now, I didn't ever think that I would have to give an all-oxone kit to somebody, but I had to give one uh, in the middle of the town centre, 
uh, please go out there and that's another thing as well we'll actually get good for me I didn't have great relationship with the fours and now get a great relationship what relationship with them do you know what I mean it was like they in the contact to us they were reading a lot so they went down uh, they were expecting the person to jump up after the first one it didn't work that way but you know what turned out to save the person's life exactly what this is meant to do so this is what we're doing uh, we're using this to save lives so that is a high point for me and a high point is when people are coming up things in the street any many day kits i how would you do the last one or had to use it on somebody yesterday uh, and it saved their life do you know what i mean so this is one of the ones that we know of there's obviously a lot of people out there that we give kits to that we don't know do you know what I mean? But they have actually been used in every single kit that gives you the potential is in every single kit in order to save somebody's life. So I think it's very important to keep getting the kits out, uh, making people aware of them, and not just uh, giving them to the people who are at risk, but the people who are joined about them. Family, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, mothers, fathers, people like that. And then obviously looking at it, so we look at the bigger picture now. So it's obviously anybody that's working with the public. So for instance, we think taxi drivers should be having them. We think if you a public toilet, is anybody a public toilet where that's a shopping centre where that's like a lad books or something like that? We'll leave it over there. Yes, yeah, yeah, we'll just leave it like that. Thanks, Scott. Can we just hear for Stuart and then we'll wrap up, Kerry Ann? Thanks. That's right, I am Stuart. Um, basically, what the volunteer program for me has been, uh, it's been good for me uh, as a as both of my sporting really. Um, obviously, they were getting that push myself through my own anxiety and, and mental health problems. Um, I attended groups run by Down and Point Scotland uh, to obviously help that and put my name forward to become a volunteer while I was there. Um, I thought it would be really good for me and it gives me a chance to help others as well. My own lived experience plus the part of training that we got with Turning Point, um, it was just as important in kind of learning and development. Um, as, as much as it's been challenging at times, I've been able to train others in the locks on and I've had the chance to talk to a lot of people and get the, get the awareness out of it, um, which obviously you know, they could save lives as a reason. So, um, but so obviously since I've started, my confidence has grown so much um, and it's been great for my own recovery to. Um, I'm struggling really to just participate in any groups but for a lot of years. My confidence has grown to a point now where I can now facilitate them as well. Something I couldn't really imagine not, not so long ago. So overall, the program's been great. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah. And lastly, for us, it's just a wee thank you. Um, just to say thanks to everybody that supported us through it, and we hope this isn't the end. So last slide, please. We couldn't do it without our volunteers. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's good to see the work that you're doing down in Ayrshire. Um, so now we have a final presentation from Change, Grow, Live. Can I now invite Liz, Julian, Mikey, Yanni, Dave from Edinburgh and West Lovian onto the screen to talk about continuing supplies during COVID. Hi everyone. Thanks for having us here today. My name's Dave. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. As you see, some of the photos on the screen just now was our launch in early February, very cold day out in Edinburgh City Centre. But the origins of this project go back further. Yanni, who you'll meet shortly, uh, started looking at this about four years ago when he visited the SDF and the project was started there. But without the extra time and resources, whilst managing a, a busy job, it's impossible myself. About two years ago, when I attempted to get peers trained to distribute the walks on within our community space and came up against the same barriers, uh, staff take priority for training spaces. But this is a medication, it's not suitable for peers to be distributing. So it got put in the back burner. That changed. COVID came along and provided an opportunity. Uh, the training was being devolved in localities, and myself and Yanni seized on that opportunity. We put together a training package, concentrating on the substances involved, the, char the characteristics of the people uh, that are at risk, how it's bought an overdose, overdose awareness type stuff, as well as naloxone, 
how it's used and then some practical training on how to make an approach. We recruited a cohort of uh, naloxone educators, almost 20 in total, uh, and those were, they consisted of people with lived as well as living experience uh, to make this realistic on the streets. We've done this with but no extra money, no extra funding, but we juggled some time and we made it happen. And that, that's, the, that's the, the title of our presentation is Just Get It Done. On that, I'm going to pass you over to Julian, who's going to talk about his experience about joining the group and doing the training. Hello, my name's Julian. I used heroin for 22 years as a way to run through my fears and hide through my feelings. I was in a very dark place and thought the only solution was to feel nothing. So I have a lot of lived experience as an addict and drug user. More recently, I found recovery, and I'm now 32 months clean. My recovery plan is driven by me, but I had support along the way from CGL, who signposted me towards smart meetings where I learned to live life on life's terms, good or bad, without the need for drugs. I volunteer now for CGL as much as I can because I'm grateful for recovery and believe it would be too good for others if things will happen to you. When I heard about CGL training peers and getting the locks on out in the community, I wanted to get involved. I joined the training course a bit later than some of the team and was a bit anxious, but I was glad to be around people who seemed confident and more capable than myself. I would borrow bits from them to feed my own needs, and as usual, my ability would be sure to grow. Training started with what does an overdose look like? Even though I'd used for all those years, I was fortunate that I never went over or used with anybody that did. I learned when to give CPR and the signs of overdose, unresponsiveness, and people's and fingertips. The trainer taught us how to use naloxone and the phone for an ambulance is the most important thing. Naloxone is effective for 20 minutes or so. And if the first dose you inject into the thigh muscle doesn't bring somebody around, after two minutes you can redose and the each kit has five doses. It's important to be aware that after giving naloxone to someone, the opiates in their system will start to overpower the naloxone and that after 20 minutes it's likely they will go back into overdose. That's why it's so important to call the ambulance. Another point to note is that naloxone will put a person into withdrawal and they might not be all that happy with you about it. But given the choice between life or death, I know what I would choose. The bottom, the bottom line is that naloxone gives you time for medics to arrive and can help save a life. After training, I knew what to do, but I still had this issue. How do you walk up to a stranger and say, I think you need naloxone? I was intimidated by labeling someone as a drug user and scared of the reaction and felt it could possibly end badly, I was wrong. Even the people who weren't users were positive and were willing to take kits from us. I found this to be amazing, but I shouldn't have been that surprised as we all know someone still struggling with the madness. One of the kits was used in week walk about an hour after we gave it out and probably helped save a life. To be part of that felt amazing. For me, it's been great to be involved and it's helped with my confidence. It's also helped me to take stock in myself. Speaking with drug users has been helpful for me as it's a reminder of where I was and where I am today. Yeah, I'll just pass over to Liz now. So Liz, we've got a really great way of approaching people on the streets and being in the community. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the approach we've got? Yeah, as it's friend, uh, we know what to look for because I've got 39 years of being an addict myself, so I know what sense to look for and I just approach them head on and just ask them if they've ever heard in a lock zone and uh, some of them say yes, some say no, some of them say yeah, it's in my kitchen cupboard and I just say to them, I'm like, well, what? If it's in your kitchen cupboard, that's no good because at the end of the day, you need it on your person in order to use it and administer it. Because if you've seen somebody, if you've got long street, you've seen somebody uh, overdosing in the street, then um, no, I mean, it's no good in your kitchen cupboard. You wouldn't be able to administer it on them, put them in the recovery position. And what about when the ambulance is well? And what about when people say they don't want the lock so Yeah, they say, I don't need that. I don't you know what I mean? It's it. It's a total denial because at the end of the day they've spent that long hiding from society and themselves. So I mean it's got to, they're in denial, they don't want to put it out there to be on parade due to the fact that they're users it because it's been that long that they have been users and they've just been looked down on society for such a long period of time. So I mean it's the last thing they've got to say because it's like alien or something negative. 
say and it's interesting and you get quite a good response on the streets Liz. Why do you think that is? I think it's because I'm more determined that they're going to receive it because at the end of the day it's saving lives, you know what I mean? It's a positive thing, we're saving lives here and the more we're put out in the street the better because I mean Scotland's the highest in the UK and in the world of people having those overdoses. So uh, yeah, I think it's a bit, it's a bit time we done something about that and help save lives and therefore we're doing a bit good thing, aren't we? And you really like being out on the streets and it's like everyone's noticed that about you. Have you got any memorable experiences? Yeah, we were walking down the walk one day and I seen <coughs> excuse me, I seen a young girl aged with my daughter and uh, yeah, she was just she was walking, she was with some other actors, some other people that are using. And uh, she just seemed so lost. She was like twenty four year old or something and she had no roof over her head. She was no no job, no no future, you know. I mean, I just felt really sorry for her and uh, I gave her a big hug. You wouldn't have meant to give her a hug, but we found it, but I did anyway. And uh, she, she'd noticed that we worked for CGL. And she says, Oh, I've got a work. I had a work with CGL, but it's since lost my phone to the addiction and that. I says, Right, we'll leave you the number. And she's now engaging based something to CGL. She's doing amazing, not only she has pride, and so you know, that's a good thing. And those type of things it just encourages us to do more this. Yeah, for sure. And giving back, you've been 39 years in addiction, but I thought I was going to die on drugs, you know what I mean? 39 years. So now I'm able to give something back and help people and make a difference and save a life and help them with like phone numbers and one point them to places where you can get something to eat, like closure by food banks, <coughs> any soup kitchens or that, or even their phone numbers, they like. Treatment centers and stuff like that. In any way possible, or houses, any way possible, you can help them. Get, you can do it and be more approachable because people like the experience, you know what I mean? Rather than just yeah, text two people. I mean, they're listening to us because they're willing to open up a lot more. Thanks a lot, Liz. Hi, guys. I'm Mike. I'm a being the world's an educator for Change School of Edinburgh. Back in 2013, I trained in the world's on train train on Edinburgh prison. Well, working as a peer mentor in the jail. I never got the chance to do anything with my training and became frustrated thinking that funding had been wasted. Uh, they were meant to get kits on the lease, and this never ever happened. I was uh, working with CGL Edinburgh on coming after them during the start of the pandemic. And uh, we made aware to me they were doing a, a long term training course, and I thought I would get involved. This organization, uh, the line will get involved with us, get a try. I don't want to fear over it, I don't want to fear over barriers and stigma because of my past. My whole life I had been involved in drug dealing, I had a crazy lifestyle for chaos. I was scared that the people in the streets would laugh at me, bosses would be all untrusting. Hopefully, the two guys that were on it, maybe Nanny, I beat my fear, and both of them were really quite amazing. And Tell me when they started in this line of work, they felt the same. My self esteem was very low. I had a very seven year addiction. I was trained and had the streets. I was really shocked at the results. Uh, people on the streets had all different opinions overall. The feeling was great. There were so many positive interactions with people. They were really grateful to tell us we were all doing a great job. I met so many people I knew from inside the jails and with my own scheme. We're all happy to leave. receive overdose advice in the walks on kits and a good friendly chat during a pandemic. I even gave the walks on kits to family members and people I had supplied drugs to and used drugs with. I was once asked by a member of the NHS I was collecting kits for I was selling the kits. I was shocked at this because it was a manager at an NHS place. I was supposed to be in a position to trust, but helping people save life gave me a purpose. So I just kept doing it. So they said on drugs, it was now really helping me save lives from the streets, involving my own self esteem. We've shown other users that there's a life after addiction. I'd like to find change for the for helping me, helping push this project and helping build my self esteem, especially during this pandemic. Never thought I would get the chance to use my initial training I've learned from the jail. 
It's also a great way to point people to services and bring the common drugs used in the different areas, the different strength of drugs, the different prices on drugs. We fed this back to the drug task force on the drug definitions. The importance of this stuff can never be underestimated. Just as they have found out last year that we, who don't train them with us, had passed away. Very sad and frustrating, but that is the reality of addiction. I'm going to next slide, please, and I'll hand it over to Yanni. Thanks, Mike. <coughs> um, you know, we've got this comment up here, I'll, I'll not repeat it, but these are the type of things we hear on the street, uh, and we hear that from just general members of the community, but we we'll also hear it from people who use drugs ourselves. And it's as if the, the stigma of society is so great that people like self internalize that stigma and come out with that language. You know, and when language like that comes out, language causes stigma, stigma causes prejudice, prejudice causes discrimination. Um, and it makes it a little bit more difficult for us to do our jobs. So we're quite often thinking when we're out on the streets, you know, there's a little balance between, you know, making people feel uncomfortable and maybe bursting people's bubble uh, or, or, or outing them. People don't like to be outed in their community or in a business area as someone who might use drugs. Um, but the way we see it is we're there to save lives. And once people hear that we're people who've had addiction problems ourselves or still have addiction problems or are in recovery, we get a completely whole different attitude. And we hear things from people like, I told my CPN I, I don't use, so I've never took the lock stone. I will hear things like, oh, I thought you were judging us, but then I heard you were in recovery and now I feel comfortable speaking to you. So, um, yeah, we've been through a lot of thoughts like that and really improved the way we've approached people and thought a lot about that. So not everyone was always happy to start with, but once we opened up those conversations with people on the streets, the responses we get are amazing. And quite often that's the stage when other people would have been back in the way and for these people aren't receptive to receiving overdose awareness, these people aren't receptive to receiving advice, but they're actually, in fact, the most vulnerable people who need it the most. And the peers have just been absolutely invaluable in providing the lock zone in that way. I'd just like to say something about Dave's touched on it and, and Mikey's touched on it about some of the barriers we've faced. But we have, you know, faced a few barriers and received a little bit of skepticism from some people in services. We've had comments like, what are you doing with all those kids? Are you just giving 20 kids to one person? Are you dropping loads off in a house? Can peers be trusted with these kids? You can't give out kits anonymously. We've heard that. Whereas like, the basis of a good harm reduction program should be uh, people can engage with it anonymously where appropriate. Uh, you can't have any more kits if you're not being responsible with them. We've had these sorts of responses. And do you know, the figures speak for itself. These guys have given out 527 kits since the 1st of February. And to put that in context, that's more than all the statutory drug and alcohol services in Edinburgh, all the voluntary drug and alcohol services in Edinburgh, and all the housing support services in Edinburgh combined. So we're all getting paid for harm reduction work. So I'd just like to finish off by saying like a big thank you for the peers reiterating that We've received no funding whatsoever for this work. We've done it off on the roof. Me and Dave have been really frustrated. We haven't been able to value and develop and train the peers in the way that I can, in the way that we would have liked to. And just to say thanks very much for everyone who has supported us. Thank you. Thank you, Liz, Julie, Mikey, Yanni, and Dave for your presentation today. So um, I'm just going to finish up um, just to say that uh, unfortunately we are out of time. Um, I do want to just say that um, 31st of August is International Overdose Awareness Day. Um, there are lots of activities I'm aware that are happening in local areas to mark the occasion. There's also going to be the launch of a large national naloxone awareness raising campaign. So keep your eyes and ears and everything else peeled for that coming up over the next couple of months as well. Lastly, just want to really thank everybody for all your time and everybody for attending. Special thanks to today's speakers. We really appreciate you being here and to share your experiences. So thanks so much to everybody and Goodbye for now.